Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is John Cambia, and this is Mailbag. What is Mailbag? Well, I'm glad that you asked. See, every day on the John Cambia Show, Monday through Friday, we take the second half of the show to take live comments and questions from the audience. But what if you watch, you know, some of the other 22 hours during the day when we're not doing the John Cambia Show live? If you want to get a comment and question in, Mailbag is here for you. And here's how you send in a question or comment to be read on Mailbag. Simply go down to the description of any of our videos and you'll see a tip link. Click on that there or enter it in manually at www.streamelements.com slash movieblogtv slash tip. You'll be able to send in a comment or question for us to read on Mailbag if we deem your comment or question appropriate to be used on the show. And of course, you'll be supporting the channel at the same time. And I'm here today joined by Robert Meyer Burnett. Robert, how you doing? John, it is a great pleasure to be here. And a great pleasure to have you here and a great pleasure to have all of you guys here as we start getting into these questions that you guys have sent in. So let's not waste any time and get right to it. We're going to start off here with Ginger Beef Jr. who writes in. <laughs> One of two. Hi, John, Rob, and crew. I love all you guys, and I watch daily. Well, thank you so much for that, man. You were speaking about Netflix Marvel shows coming to Disney Plus in Canada in today's episode. This would have been the other day. Mm. Disney Plus in Canada does have parental controls, which you are required to set up uh, to watch content on Star, which has the Fox content and R-rated content, etc. Just wanted to say hi, and being a Canadian resident, offer some insight on that. P.S. Tell Rob I'm in love with his collecting hot toys thanks to him. Uh, or I'm in love with collecting hot toys, thanks to him. Peace and love. All right, thanks for sending that in, Ginger Beef. And we, yeah, we were talking about that the other day. That So it's an interesting scenario they have because in the United States, which is, you know, Disney Plus's main, main ground here, they have Disney Plus, but they also have Hulu. In most other markets, they don't also have Hulu. Right. So for all the adult-leaning content, they can put all that stuff on Hulu. By the way, I love Hulu. I, I I'm do, on I, Hulu more than I'm on Disney Plus, to be honest with you. I agree. But in a lot of other markets that don't have Hulu, they put on this, I don't fully understand it because I'm not there, but they have like a star section or something like that, like a section on Disney Plus that will have that content that you got parentally unlock. So I don't know if the long-term plan for Disney is to get Hulu in all the other markets as well, or if the you know, the target of Disney is to eventually make in the U S have an adult section on Disney plus if Bob Iger was still here, I'd say, no, they're never going to put the adult content on Disney plus, but, but Papa Iger isn't in charge anymore. So I really don't know which way do you think they're going to go? Well, I think they kind of, I, I mean, look, you know, then I, I would not say that the Netflix Disney show, uh, the, the Marvel shows, I wouldn't want my eight-year-old stumbling across Daredevil. Right. You know? Right. However, I do think it kind of all belongs together. And if they do have this star paywall domestically, I think that's it's not a bad idea. And, you know, it kind of in a way, like, I don't have kids, but if I did, I'd be like, well, son, one day when you're 12 or 13, maybe I'll let you have the star code and you right. can watch. I you mean, will it's be some, a man. You will be the man. And it will, instead of a bar mitzvah, you can watch the Disney Netflix shows on Star, you know, or the Marvel shows. But uh, something like that, I mean, I, you know, I, I think that Disney always has to protect their brand. And intermingling children's fare, like, I don't know, your favorite animated classic, like Snow White and Daredevil. Mm, I don't think that hallway fight. It sends a confusing message. It does. We don't need to have a poison apple and have Daredevil busting chops in a hallway. But it is interesting to see how they handle it in different markets. Absolutely. And by the way, John, I'm happy people buy Hot Toys figures, but I take no responsibility when your life <laughs> spirals out of control. All right. Next up, we've got old Danny Boy who writes uh, one of five. Wow. So. I've been thinking more about it, and we always compare Boba Fett from his show to his character in The Mandalorian. However, with more thought on it, I came to realize that his character didn't make any sense in that show either. Uh, cooler, absolutely. But even though we all love seeing him ending subscriptions to life for those stormtroopers, <laughs> everything we know about him prior indicates that he had, at, at the very least, a close working relationship with the Empire. That's not true. Actually, that's not true at all. Anyway, he even seems surprised slash scared uh, when he says they're back. The Empire is back. Like, dude, it's just your previous employer, not your enemy. The Boba Fett show could have uh, very easily 
hyper-focused on the enemy not being the pikes that killed the Tuscans, but instead the empire. And that's why he has come, that's why he has this come to Jesus moment of, um, maybe I should work for the, uh, maybe I should work for the bad guys. It would have made it more of an emotional journey because while he wasn't the one that killed the Tuscans, he would be forced to look at his past and look at the things he had done as not just jobs, but affected people. What, uh, but what do I know? I would love to get yours and Rob's thoughts. Okay, mm. so here's my first thought on this. Is if you read any of the comic book stuff too, Boba Fett never had a close working relationship with the Empire. He was a bounty hunter. He would take jobs from anybody. And if anything, the Boba Fett show on TV that we just watched shows that your current allegiances swings with your latest contract. Look at Black Kirstanton. He was there to kill Boba Fett. Right. But... Okay. He that, was paid to do that. Yep. That job's done. Um, you want me to fight with you? All right. I'll fight with you. And <laughs> that's just kind of the way it was. And if you look at the comic books, Rob, I mean, there are fights to the death between Boba Fett and Darth Vader in the comic book. So, no, Boba Fett never had a close working relationship. They, they are at one point, it's another contract. And I took it and I did it. He never, he never said he particularly liked them. Right. He was also under the employee of Jabba the Hutt, and he probably would have come back and killed him too. If it wasn't Bib Fortuna sitting on that throne, if Jabba was still there, he would have taken out Jabba. So I really don't see anything wrong with that. Also, the whole idea about tying the Empire into it again, here's the thing. The Empire can only be your foil so many times. You have to start expanding this universe. And I think the thing about Boba Fett was, the show Boba Fett, was they wanted to get more into that wider underground world. So yeah. I, I, even though the show ended up being a mixed bag to be kind, um, I still don't think it was the wrong move to move away from the Empire. I don't know, Rob, what do you think? I, well, I agree, but in Empire, you know, Boba Fett even reminds Vader, look, <laughs> you better not screw this up. <laughs> you know, if he dies when he's put in a carbon freeze and Vader's like, look, you'll be compensated if there's a the problem. The Empire will compensate you if he's damaged. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a job. There is no loyalty there. It's like, I'm here to do a job, and if you mess this up, Vader, you're going to pay me. And yeah. he says it. Even Vader's like, I'll pay you. So there's no, there's no, it's a business relationship, and there's no loyalty there. You hire Boba Fett, and you get his loyalty. All right. Next up, we've got uh, Gary Madigan, who writes, one of two. Hey, John and crew. Greetings from Ireland. Well, greetings, nice. Gary. Uh, we've been talking a lot about Ireland we recently have. with the Batman and the ratings board. I was watching the John Campus show with my dad where you said Daniel Day-Lewis was the GOAT. He's absolutely the GOAT. And he told me when he was working in Wicklow, uh, Ireland, where Daniel Day-Lewis lives, he would meet him at the bar that he went to. My dad worked in Wicklow for two weeks and ran into him many times. He said that he was very down to earth and even had some beers with him uh, three or four times. Imagine sharing a beer with Daniel Day-Lewis, lucky son of a bitch. Well, listen, this is how the cool is thing. that? The coolest <laughs> thing about Daniel Day Lewis is just how hyper grounded he is because he only did like one movie. I think it averaged out to like one movie every three and a half to four years. He didn't, he wasn't about the movie star life. And like he's like all. a cobbler, he's a shoe cobbler. Like, how much more salt of the earth grounded dude can you possibly get? And I don't drink. But if I had the opportunity to sit down and hit back some beers with Daniel Day-Lewis, the greatest of all time, oh, yeah, I would have done that. Of course. <laughs> and, you know, I think after a few beers, you would have been like, I'm an oil man. <laughs> I'm an oil man. <laughs> so good. I drink your milkshake. You know, here's the thing, too, about him that I've, that I've always just been stunned and on wonder is his ability to go from a very delicate, gentle soul to the most terrifying you look at like his character in gangs of new york bill the butcher, butcher. dude i mean you you look at him from you know phantom thread and then last of the mohicans i mean th this guy could be everything and be anything by the way how great is he in last of the mohicans oh stay alive that's oh, so good no matter so the guy is insane and you know, I remember when he announced, out of nowhere it felt like, his retirement. A lot of people speculated. I did too. Speculated, is there something wrong with his health? Is there something else? 
Turns out, no, he's still around. He just, yeah, I like, I like going to my local pub. I like cobbling my shoes. I it was never about the movie star life. But I got to ask, Rob, do you think there could be anything that could draw him out of retirement? Like, because, I mean, I know I as a movie fan, to have the greatest of all time come out and do another movie, I mean, it's just like one of the top things of my wish list. I, I mean, what do you think could come along? Because he's done it all. He's won multiple Academy Awards. He's worked with the best directors. What could possibly be there for him that might persuade him to come out of retirement for one more run? You know, I'd like to believe it's the power of the story. Right. I think if somebody had, and I have, John, I have no idea what this project would be. But if someone came to him and said, listen, I'm, I mean, it'd have to probably be somebody of some note, you know, Scorsese or Spielberg or somebody of that ilk came to him and said, look, I've wanted to make this movie for decades. And now I finally got the script in a place where I think it's good. I need you to star in this. I can't make this movie without you. And if Daniel Day Lewis believed that, and then, of course, read the material and he'd have to connect with it. I think he might. Mm. Because I don't think, like, I can understand the movie star life takes people away from their home for a long time. And, 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 and the simple pleasures of life. When you're making a movie, it's not exactly glamorous. You're living in a trailer. You're working 12 hours a day. You go to sleep. You get up. It's on a, it's not, there's nothing glamorous about making movies. It's glamorous when you, like, get to go to premieres. Yeah. And I think, though, that, going back to his normal life after doing everything, like he probably achieved in his mind everything he ever wanted to achieve as an actor. But I do think that artists recognize the passion of other artists. And I think when they get together, if you can, if somebody, if, if he were to see in your eyes the fire that he knows is there, and when you tell him no one else can do this, and if it was Spielberg or Scorsese or, I don't know, David Fincher, pick your director, if he saw that, he might be convinced to come back. Maybe. One can hope. Paul Thomas Anderson, I mean, Phantom Thread. Can you imagine? That's not exactly the most showy role in the world, but no. my God, was he good in that oh, role. Oh, he was so good in that movie. All right, next up, uh, we go to Jessica Quintel, who writes, what are your thoughts on maybe the big H, Henry Cavill, joining the MCU as Captain Britain in the future? Uh, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't care. I mean... Uh, I love Henry Cavill, I do, but let's face it. The only reason, and I've been asked this, by the way, Jessica, I've been asked this question many times. Ca Henry Cavill as, as Captain Britain, many times. Oh, because he's played Superman and he's British. So, I mean, look, I love Henry. Look, this is why I don't like doing X actor and X role questions. Uh, look, my, my answer to it would be as always, same thing. I don't care who they get as long as it's a talented performer. Henry Cavill is a very talented performer. There are many other very talented performers too. And I don't see why Henry Cavill would pigeonhole himself like going from Superman to playing Marvel's one of Marvel's Superman light characters. I, I, I just <laughs> he don't look see good in that suit though. Oh, he would look great in the suit, but there are many others who would as well. And, right. But let's face it, the only reason anybody asks that is because he played Superman. Therefore, he just gotta play this other character that's kind of like Superman. And I don't see I don't know, Rob, do would you have more enthusiasm for it? No, I mean Look, it'd be fine, but to be honest, John, I think you and I kind of want the same thing. We want a second Superman movie where yeah, Henry Cavill. I want to see Henry Cavill back as Superman. Yeah, that's what I want to see too. All right. I mean, I love him, but I, I would lo look at that guy. Look at the magnificence behind you there. It's Henry, man. One always more time. Looking over One the, more time. Always Henry. looking over the studio. All right. Next up, Shakespeare adapter writes, part one of four. Wow. Many years ago, someone told me that he doesn't watch the Oscars because he can find out the winners in the newspaper now online news for people like him it doesn't matter if the ceremony was made shorter uh, i did some research well let me address that first well of course but considering the oscars is the single most watched television broadcast in the world that's not a sporting event sure there are people like that yeah but there are just a hell of a lot of other people who do anyway at any rate i did some research and found out the bafta film awards uh, is at least two hours long whereas the oscars is at least three hours long Historically, the Oscars has been at least three hours long or longer, as a matter of fact. Uh, currently, the BAFTA Film Awards has 25 categories, while the Oscars has 23 award categories, with 21 of the categories overlapping between the two ceremonies. 
Something is not right if the Oscars need at least three hours to give out 23 awards, while BAFTA is able to give out their 25 awards within two hours, or two and a half to three hours, if the BAFTA Film Awards ceremony goes over. All right. So, the, the thing that is obviously missing from the math here is that not all ceremonies are the same. Now, if an event was simply... Welcome to the Academy Awards, presenting the award for Best Cinematography, Robert Meyer Burnett. Robert comes up. The nominees are blah, 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 blah. And the winner is blah. Da, 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 da. Oh my gosh, I won. Walk up to the stage, take the award, say thank you for 30 seconds walking off. Presenting the next award for Best Adapted Screenplay is John Campia. I come up. The nominees are blah, 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 blah. The winner is blah. Oh my gosh, blah, blah, blah. Walk out through. If you do that, you can get through 40 or 50 categories. Yeah. If that's all the award ceremony was, <clears throat> that's what it'd be. The Oscars prize itself on being more than just handing out the awards. They also, there's the pomp and circumstance and the pageantry. Um, I mean, I would never, I mean, I've always wanted them to shorten the show. I never want them to touch the in memoriam. That's something they could, they can never touch. But the in memoriam and song and dance numbers to celebrate certain aspects of the film industry. I mean, that's it's always been a part of it. And I appreciate that, even though I do want them to find, to take the scalpel out and, and shave it down a bit. So I find that too, but it's not just that, it's just that the Hollywood part has a little bit more pomp and circumstance. And again, I like a little bit of pomp and circumstance. I do. Here's the thing though. What I would never want it to become and what, this is the part, Rob, that frustrates me because a lot of people are playing it this whole thing about how they're they're going to do some of the awards will be presented an hour before the show and then broadcast later. Some of them are acting like this is the video game awards, which drove me crazy. Right. Because for those of you who did not watch the video game awards, this is literally what they did. They maybe I can't remember how many actual awards they presented, but they had so many categories where they didn't even show the nominees or even name the nominees. The host, they were show, they're so busy with just playing the next video game commercial that the, they literally do this. I'm, this is not exaggeration for those of you who haven't watched the video game awards. This is literally what they did. I'm gonna make up some categories, right? But the host of the show is like, so here are your nominees for best sound design in a video game. They wouldn't even name them. They just bring up a list of five names. Here's your nominees for the for the best sound design in video games, and the winner was four. Now, here are your nominees for the list of this, and the winner was three. Now, here are some nominees for blah, 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 and literally in 15 seconds, they announced the winners for three categories. They didn't even give the nominees the honor of hearing their name called. They literally just brought up a graphic with their names, and the winner is blah, no acceptance, no moment to soak in it, nothing. And what I think is there's probably a lot of people that when they hear that the, the Oscars have canceled eight categories, which obviously they have not, they're, they're seeing that. They're seeing in their heads that what the video game awards did. And by the way, I, there's a, I'm not going to call them out, but there's somebody you and I both know that I saw them on Twitter complaining about the disrespect that the Oscars is showing these people who work so hard to get their nominations. And again, this is a friend of mine, so I'm not going to call them out. But this same person, when the video game awards happened, and the question came up about, well, they, they didn't even let them call their name. Oh, it doesn't matter. Just, just blow by. It's like, wait, there's, there's, come on. You cannot say you were okay with what the video game awards did since it doesn't really matter and then pretend you're completely offended about what's going on here. But I'll tell you what, Rob, and you know what, you know, you and I have discussed this a lot the last few days because yeah. we, we, we kind of fundamentally, we have some similar points of view on this, but also some fundamentally different ones. If we do come to the day after Oscars and they do make it look similar to what they did, mm -hmm. then I'll, I'm jumping on the bandwagon with sure. you I mean, I, 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 they, they, I'm all for them saving time, but make sure you still feel like you're giving that moment to people because you're, you're right. You're, you're nominated for an Academy Award. And while I believe 
like Aaron the other day, like she actually called out. She went one step further. She says, look, I think there's some of these categories you just got to eliminate. Right. Just get rid of them. I don't believe that. I don't believe you should eliminate the category. I believe short form storytelling is still a valuable, valuable place in the world of artistic storytelling. So keep the shorts category. But I do believe that there are people, probably the majority of people, that have less interest in those categories, spend a little less time on them in the broadcast, emphasize the time on the one that the audience cares a little bit more about, but still make sure you give them their honor. Anyway, Rob, there's, there is a difference in the length between the BAFTAs, the Oscars, well, stuff like that. How do you see all that? There's also another thing that we should take into consideration. The Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences is a, it's an organization that needs to be funded. The Oscars is their big presentation for the year. Yeah. And their commercial sales, like the Super Bowl, because of how many people watch, are very, very lucrative in terms of the Academy and what they get. So their big fundraise outside of donors, their big fundraising push for the year is are the Oscars. And the viewership of the Oscars, it, it, that's how much they can sell ad rates for. It depends on their viewership. And if their viewership drops, their ad revenue goes down, which means their operating budget changes. So by having a decreased viewership year after year after year, they have to figure out, well, how can we get more people to come back and watch the Oscars? So they're trying to make the show, as you put it, pointed out, they want to make the show great and fun to watch. They're trying to make it for the viewers. So they're trying to balance uh, how, do you, how do you have a good show and at the same time honor the artists, yeah. and make enough money that we can keep our operating budget. I mean, they have a new museum, you know. Which so they're kind of, they're hoping will kind of take the place of the Oscars a little bit of uh, funding the organization. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so there's a lot of different uh, things at play. Look, I hope they find a good balance. You and I, one thing we can agree on, we love the Oscars. It's meant so much to me my whole life. I uh, make the show 20 hours, I'll watch it all. You know, give me montages of every category. I will watch it all. As a matter of fact, I think they should make a whole day of it. You know, make it from noon to six. Make it six hours long and 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 talk about the art of of the artistry. Do interviews with go in depth with with people that are nominated. I don't care. I think people would tune in and make it six hours for me. Make it longer. But that's me. That's you know not what, everybody. You know what? Look, here's the thing. This is gonna sound contradictory because i have always wanted them to pare down the length of the oscars right and i've always every year i try to come up with some ideas to shorten it up a bit but there's also a part of me which is totally contradictory to that that okay so uh, best uh, best supporting actor goes to so and so they come up they accept the award they give a short speech and then you have 15 pre-approved press members who during, like, as soon as they, they're still on stage with the award, gets to ask them three or four questions, uh, address the questions. I would I would personally love Dude, that, I am but it would right drive a lot of people crazy. I'm right, right there with you, though. I would love that. I mean, turn the Oscars into a day of celebration for the world. We love movies. Let's. The problem is the Oscars have had a lot of fluff that's been meaningless. Yeah. That has padded out those three hours. I mean, if you make it all killer, no filler, I'm fine with whatever length you make it. It's just that the problem has been there's been... There's been a lot of fat, like each of the five best song nominees getting full two minutes right. to perform this. Like, come on, guys. Or I mean, that's 20 minutes alone. And yeah. then with interstitials, commercials in between that, that could be 30 or 40 minutes just to do the songs. And you know what? Other thing they changed. The honorary Lifetime Achievement is going to be presented during the... Uh, the Gene Herschel yeah. Award. and the Which, I'm like, oh, come on, really? That, that's the Lifetime Achievement. I know. And, and I love that. To shorten, shorten something up a bit, but to take it out entirely. The, I, and I love those things. You know, I love because they would give you an overview of someone's career. There would be some, you know, some powerhouse star that would come up to present the award, which is always fun to see that person. Yeah. And it's a celebration of the industry. Yep. But again, I'm going to give the whole thing its fair shot. We're going to watch the Oscars. We're gonna, And like the Academy themselves, we're going to evaluate how it went. I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that it's going to feel tight efficient and yet it delivers on what it means what it needs to do which is honor the recipients if they fail to do that well then we'll deal with that after the oscars but i'm going to keep my fingers crossed for now all right next up 
Thanks for writing that in Shakespeare. Uh, Capri Grant writes, this is a bit of a response to something said by a question sender in the last mailbag, but in regards to the power scaling of the MCU, when Tony fought Thor, it was after he was struck by Thor's lightning and powered up 475%. Steve wouldn't scale. Well, I mean, you're right, but here's the thing. Each the characters bring their own strengths and weaknesses. Steve wouldn't scale. No. Mm -hmm. But he would have blocked it with his adamantium shield. Or he just wouldn't have gotten hit in the first place. <laughs> right. Or I mean, so yes, like power scaling, that's that's one of the things that comic book fans I find they fall into this kind of a self-negating loop of logic where they try to compare characters in one-to-one -one scales. Well, this guy can deadlift 12,000 tons. That guy can only deadlift 10,000 tons. Therefore, but no, each character is different, unique. They have a different set of skills and abilities. And uh, I don't know, that's how I see it. What about you, Rob? I, I, I Again, I, I see it like you. You know, it's... <laughs> no one... There is no definitive percentage of, of whose power is what during what battle or this that and the other thing so it's hard to say you know i'm sure in the the encyclopedia of marvel comics they've probably given something of a scale like that but you know i i think you got to give it a little bit of leeway john i agree all <laughs> right next up we've got k rock who writes did you guys see that 50 cent is developing a movie based on the dc character zero by christopher priest so on top of his show power all of its spinoffs BMF, I don't know what that is, uh, and uh, and for life, Fifty is now entering uh, the superhero movie genre. Hardest working rapper? Well, I mean, listen, I don't know if he's the hardest working, but he's one of the smartest. Bi he's very business minded. Really, he's made. diversified himself a yep. lot. I mean, I don't know much about this Zero Project to be honest with you, but he's a guy who's not just been. Okay, now I got to focus on my next album being the biggest. No, he recognized. Look, music stars have a shelf life, unless you're a, in very, very rare company. Music stars all have shelf lives. I'm going to diversify myself. I'm going to be a full media mogul. Yeah, and uh, he's done. A hell he's of a doing job. a great job. Plus, he also is a great rapper. Yeah. So you know, I love seeing him at the Super Bowl. Wasn't expecting him, but it was kind of cool to see him there. I still don't think the I get the connection to the music video. The hanging upside down thing was a mistake, though. All right, next up, <laughs> Russell Amador writes. Hey, John, after seeing the conversation about knowing Dr. Strange cameos, uh, was that something that really needed to be discussed? Uh, it was like letting kids know those presents are all yours and they're amazing, but can't open them yet. Uh, that was a power move. Okay, so here's the thing. For those of you who don't know what he's talking about, the other day uh, we revealed to the audience that we are now in possession of a bunch of information about Dr. Not all the information. No. But a bunch of key information about Doctor Strange 2. And I will go one step further. When you say, um, what did it really need to be discussed? He yeah, asks, so is it really needed to be discussed? I would say it's a hundred percent absolutely necessary to be discussed. Because here's the thing: if I know something about an upcoming movie, and then I just pretend. For a couple of months when the speculation starts going and like blah 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 well i think this is going to happen and i knew it was going to happen the whole time mm. or i lie to the audience our our audience our community i lie to our community and go well i don't think that's going to happen when i know full well that it is the only um above board response to that is to be completely open and transparent with our community and say, just so you guys know, I've been made aware of a bunch of stuff. And so when you write in and talk to me, there's going to be things I won't answer anymore. There's going to be things like the Magneto question. That we don't know. We don't know about the Magneto question. So no we're idea. speculating with it like everybody else. But it would be completely disingenuous of me and misleading of me to game my own community and actually have factual knowledge of the movie and pretend in speculation like I don't, 
No, I will never do that to our community. Our community is the very reason why I have a job. Our community is the very reason why we have this career. Our community is the very reason this show is even here and exists. And you may not like what I have to say. And you may disagree with what I say. But you will always know that whatever I tell you, it's what I actually think. I won't always tell you the popular thing. And ain't it my job to convince you to agree with me. But no matter how much you agree or disagree with me, when I tell you something that's opinion-based, you will always know if you're part of our community that it's what I really think. And I think when you ask the question, was it really necessary to be discussed? A thousand percent. If I'm going to have credibility with my audience and always be up, up, up front with my audience, yes, absolutely had to be discussed. Well, I know, Rob, what do you think? There's something else you got to mention. <laughs> we were going to discuss this. You checked in. You you yeah. did a, a professional thing. You made a decision because of something that had happened before. You didn't want to run afoul of the powers that be because we're not here to ruin anyone's experience. Right. We're not here to cause anyone consternation or we don't want to infringe on the business that Disney's going to do. We're here to provide entertainment and knowledge and news and, and opinion. And you did the smart thing. You, you contacted them and said, hey, we've got this information. Can we talk about it? And they said... I wouldn't. Eh, maybe you shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, you, so, so however, however, I think it's important to let people know that we are looking to get credibility. And after all, you want people to tune in and think that we can provide them something that they might not get elsewhere. You know, our chemistry, our punditry, our intelligence or lack thereof, however you want to say it. Um, I think that's important. And to 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 let the audience know that we're not resting resting on our laurels, dude. We're always looking out for not necessarily scoops, but we're looking out for great material that we can give to our audience because we respect them. All right. So uh, thanks a lot for asking the question, uh, question, Russell. I hope I answered it clearly enough for you there. I appreciate that, man. All right. Next up, we got Chuck the Mystery who writes, Hey, John, one of two. So excited to see that Blue Beetle is going to theaters in August of 2023. As you were discussing in your Iron Man movie club, Stark was virtually unknown. No, no, no. We never said he was virtually unknown, but he was not the character that he is today. At any rate, uh, was virtually unknown to the mainstream minds in 2007. And by the end of 2008, he was uh, headed to A-list status. So if the movie is good, do you think Blue Beetle can follow the same trajectory for DC that Iron Man did for Marvel? Or are there factors that could hold that character back from becoming a household name, thanks. Well, I mean, here's the thing, Chuck. The answer is any movie about any character has the potential of making that character the next Iron Man. It's, it's true of any character. Like, it's, it's like when somebody asks me, hey, John, do you think a movie about X could be good? My answer is always a movie about anything could be good. A, a, a movie about... This phone was actually found in the chamber where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. <laughs> and they carbon dated this iPhone and found out it was 2,000 years old. Could a movie about that do well? It could. A Lego movie was good, so anything could. Could that happen with Blue Beetle? Yes, it's, it's possible. Is it likely? No. Because Blue Beetle is already in a cinematic universe that has existed for a number of years already with your grand poobah characters of Batman and Wonder Woman and Aquaman and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I would say it's hyper unlikely because the movie would have to be so ridiculously good that the character you, the character would have to not just find places. place. Remember, when Iron Man came out, there was no MCU. Right. So you're talking about a movie now that would have to come out where this character would have to usurp Superman and usurp Batman and usurp Wonder Woman and usurp Flash and usurp Peacemaker now and <laughs> usurp all these characters when he's never done it on the comic book page. Possible? Absolutely. Likely? I don't think likely. Rob, how would you address I that? I couldn't have said it better myself. I mean, look, as much as I love Blue Beetle in its various incarnations, I, I can't Ted, wait for this movie. Ted Kord's, yeah, and I, I love Blue Beetle but I don't think that the character, it's just a different character. We're going to love Blue Beetle. I see Blue Beetle more like Marty McFly. You know, you can't have Back to the Future without Marty McFly, and it's great. But is is Marty McFly Superman? No. 
but that doesn't mean Back to the Future isn't great. So this could be a great film. Is it going to be the basis for a whole cinematic universe? No, but it could still be great. Okay, next up. Chuck the Mystery writes, By the way, love the idea of there being a Godfather moment in succession with Shiv and Tom. I would love to see that. Speaking of which, seeing Godfather in theaters this weekend, and Rob, I have the 4K Godfather release pre-ordered. Yes. And Batman on Thursday. Yes. Which is a whole world of yes right there. So course, good. I'm going to go see the Godfather for the first time ever in my life on the big screen. I've never had that chance to do that before. But yeah, we were talking about that in succession, that there was already very much a Godfather-like betrayal at the end of the last season. And I'm looking forward to it. At some point, there's going to be a come-to-Jesus moment Shiv is going to find out it was Tom and they're going to have that moment where she puts her hands on his face and says, I know it was you, Tom. I know it was you. But you know what? It he breaks just, my heart. I mean, she's been cuckolding him the whole time and he's he's been he's now reasserted himself. I think it's kind of cool. Uh, there's so much good about that show, man. So much good about and that show. And I love show. Sarah Snook. I have a crush. All right. Justin writes, I saw Hugh Jackman as Harold Hill on Broadway in The Music Man the other day. That's an amazing experience. And the show was absolutely phenomenal. I walked in blind knowing nothing about the show and wow. was thoroughly entertained. I, I have said before, and I stand by it, Hugh Jackman is the best entertainer in the world. I think when you, you look as, as the overall package, he's an Academy Award caliber actor with several nominations he is a grammy caliber singer he he's a broadway level dancer when it comes to the full package and how high he is you know because you get somebody like, like justin timberlake right somebody's and i i like jt very much i do so well he can sing and dance and act well yeah but compare his acting to hugh jackman's acting i mean Jackman is in like a, an upper echelon across the board. And I, that's why I say I believe Hugh Jackman is all round the best entertainer in the world. And have you ever seen any of his videos where he's like been doing live shows and then you pull out his phone and start live streaming oh, him doing yeah, a live yeah. show? Yeah. Like he's just incredible. No, he's amazing. Have you ever had a chance to see him on stage or live? I have not seen him on stage or live, but I interviewed him on the set of x2 when i was doing the, oh, the, wow. the and he is bar none the most charismatic individual i've ever spoken to like that guy radiates you know and we, we had a long conversation and he was you know he's very present and he was just an amazing and that was dude that was 19 years ago no it was 20 years ago it was 2002 and uh he's an amazing guy he's the first celebrity i introduced ray to and Ray was just, because uh, he was so, great to meet you, Ray. How are you doing, man? And like shaking his hand and laughing at Ray's jokes and <laughs> like just, just total class. That dude, he will always be good in my books. All right, next up. Dr. Strange 2, oh no, sorry, let me get to, oh yeah, Dr. Strange 2 guests is the name of the person. <laughs> I wanted to. Here's my prediction. When, when we see evil Wanda in the trailer, maybe it's a different Wanda. I say this because I can't see Disney making Wanda dark. I sure can. Um, not when they had the op the option to make Ray dark in in episode seven through nine of Star Wars. Big difference. Disney's not deciding which characters go dark. Lucasfilm and Marvel are two different things. And by the way, this is the same Marvel that just took our very good Goody Two Shoes, Sharon Carter. <laughs> right. And turned her into what's the name of the character again not the arms dealer the uh, um, power broker uh, the power broker and turned her into the power broker this is the same marvel that just did that and ray in star wars I, besides the fact they're completely different companies under the same umbrella company but lucasfilm and marvel ray is the headline character of that franchise wanda is not so I, we're gonna get let me get through the rest of your question here but i'm just saying that that's a false equivalency anyway uh, just a gut feeling, Doctor, or sorry, just a just a gut feeling that evil Wanda is is a different universe. I just can't see them turning a face heel, especially not one of the Avengers. Hmm. Just a guess. I could be wrong, but yeah. What are your thoughts? Thanks for the show and bring on the filthy. Well, thank you so much for that, Doctor Strange. Well, Robbie, look, one of the things we know in the trailer, we see two separate Wandas. 
I mean, we literally see Wanda standing with herself or one de- crouched on our knees, the other standing kind of teary eyed in front of her. We see multiple Wandas, so I've got no doubt. <clears throat> but I have believed, you guys know this who watch the show, I have been saying for a couple years now, I believe Wanda is going to be either the or a antagonist of Doctor Strange the Multiverse of Madness. And narratively, it's where you got to go. I mean, sorry, let me, that's too strong. It's not where you have to go. But narratively, that is a rich place to go. Well, yeah, and look, it, it, it builds on what they started with WandaVision. Yes. I mean, she's dealing with grief, and that grief was only magnified by what happened, you know, with her kids, with Vision, with the whole town, with Agatha Harkness. I mean, because Agatha not was, even though Agatha was there. At the end of the day, Wanda was still the prote- the antagonist of that show. And the it dark was hole. Her doing all of it. You know, I mean, it's she's been led down a very dark path. And pain. It has become one of my favorite human experience themes in stories when storytellers examine what pain can do to people. It doesn't matter how good they are, who write or what the Joker said to Batman is true. All it takes is one bad day. Yeah. And Wanda has had a lot of bad days. She's had a lot of bad days. And so, I look, am I saying she is the villain of the movie? I'm not saying that. I'm saying, you know, for years I've said I think she will be. And, uh, yeah, and I think there's a fundamental difference between her and Ray. But anyway, excellent thought. And you're right. There are multiple Wandas in this. We'll just have to see how that all plays out. Thanks for writing that in, Doctor Strange. All right, next up, Luke writes, Hey, John and Rob, in the Doctor Strange 2 poster, one of the shards of glass looks like C'thon. Uh, Do you think C'thon is in the movie? I guess you already know what happens in the movie, but give the tea if he could be in it, bring on the filthy. Well, again, there are significant things we know about this movie. Right. But we don't know everything no, about the movie. No, we don't know movie. everything. But, you know, Rob, go back. You and I have talked quite a while ago about C'thon very possibly playing a role in this and several big theories going around online about it do you think we're going to see Cathan in this I thing? think that Cathan has a relationship with the Darkhold and if you know about the Marvel mythology there's probably a good bet that um Cathan could show up in this movie because I think the Darkhold is a factor I think it's going to be a major factor <laughs> yeah. in this thing major major factor all right next up uh Roxo writes couple of theories for the Batman one they haven't shown him yet. The Riddler will have the question mark engraved on his forehead. They have shown him, and he does not have a question mark engraved on his right. forehead. Uh, that has been revealed now in a new clip they put out on Good Morning America. Unless he's got makeup on. Uh, true, but I, he doesn't seem like that kind of guy. No. <laughs> uh, he grabs forehead like Hush. Uh, I believe a lot of this movie is pulling from that storyline. Two, Batman will go by vengeance at first, maybe. Uh, how cool would it be? Oh, no, sorry. This is a, that's a different one. And two, Batman will go by vengeance first. Will he go by the name Vengeance? I don't think so. I mean, it's it's definitely possible because we do in one of the trailers here, Catwoman, call him, what do you say, Vengeance, right? Right. But I have a feeling that's a, a mocking kind of term. Yeah, like what do, you, what do you say, hot stuff? Yeah, or <laughs> you know, somebody says, you know, I am invincible. Then somebody says, well, let's go, Mr. Invincible. Right. You know, something like that. Exactly. I think it's something more like that, but you never know. I mean, Batman at this point is, no, 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 it's not. Batman at this point is at a very, very early stage of his career. And we already know from the very first trailer that the envelope the Riddler leaves at the crime scene was to the Batman. So, yes, I don't think... I think that settles it. I think that settles His name won't be Vengeance. Now, we'll watch this. We'll find out Roxo is right. <laughs> All right. Next up. Uh, Dre Jenificent. I hope I'm saying that right. Writes, how cool would it be if a well-known director co-opt with a studio to allow real-time film clips and footage of a huge blockbuster film to be released to the public while in production? That wouldn't be cool at all. That's a horrible idea. Uh, the public could then even possibly vote on the ending. Oh, fuck no. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Oh, hey, dude, listen. All due respect. And hey, you know what? Uh, Dre Jenificent, you're you're trying to think out of the box, and that's awesome. That's I encourage that. Think out of the box. Think differently. Great. But I cannot emphasize what a horrible shit show of an idea that would be. 
No, there's a reason, you know, Eddie, the 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 muffler repairman who lives two doors down from you, isn't making movies in Hollywood. Right. You know, or why I am not making movies in Hollywood. That is a horrible idea. We not never should have a say in what the story tells. You know, it's funny, Rob. It like I said, we as a fans, and I include myself in this too, I include all of us in this. We can quite often be a very hypocritical bunch. Because whenever we hear about a oh, a studio said no to a director, well, no <laughs> respect the sanctity of the story give let the director tell his story yeah we say that with students but then we bring up an idea is uh they should have a poll to say what they have should they, oh yeah we should have a say in it it's like no 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 no. and we are very hypocritical that way i i don't know what maybe i'm not just seeing this right do you do you like the idea of live streaming as they're shooting scenes in a movie and giving maybe audiences a vote and how the movie turns out well i, I mean I think as somebody, you know, who's worked in behind the scenes, it could be fun to see the 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 inner workings on a, a movie set for those people who've never been on one. That could be interesting to show people before the scene is shot and after the scene is shot, maybe. But there's no way. Yeah, it's called special features on a Blu-ray. Yeah, that's, there's no way that I would want to give somebody a say in the story that I'm telling while it's being produced. I mean, that's absurd. Hopefully the story that you're telling has already been decided upon before you start shooting it. Yes. You know, and and to think that, well, we don't know what our ending is. It's a hundred million dollar movie, but we don't know the ending. Perhaps you guys do. <laughs> I mean, I don't I don't think that would be good. Uh, I don't either. All right, next up. Uh we got uh Stefan who writes, Are you going to play Elder Ring? You know what's funny? I was out uh me and our buddy Ryan and his sister. We were out for dinner the other night, and as we were walking to our cars and parking, I said, oh, by the way, I'm thinking about getting an Elden Ring. And my buddy Ryan said, don't. He said, right now it's a mess. That game's a mess. And I'm like, okay. Apparently, he said there's a bunch of people having a bunch of problems with it and all that kind of stuff. So I am not planning on it right now, but we'll see what happens uh, later on. Thanks for asking, Stefan, because I'm always looking for new games to play. All right, Garden Variety Vagabond writes, one of three. Hey, John and Rob. So I am a geek, and I have tracked every episode of TV that I have watched since 2007. Holy wow. crap. Wow. I track many data points to include where I saw them. So as we discuss the streaming wars, I have the data of the winners for myself. I was not streaming all the way back, so I analyzed the last five years of data. That was 339 shows watched or in my projected queue of announced shows in producing using eight streaming sites. 28% uh, was on Amazon. 24% was on Hulu, 11% on Netflix, 10% on Disney+, 10% on HBO Max, 7.5% on CW, and 2.5% on Apple+. Plus. My propensity are Marvel slash DC slash Lucas, Sci-Fi, NCIS, uh, Lenkov shows. Amaz or Amazon Prime has won by, by far, and with Disney, has the best extra features. You know, Amazon, which by the way, I, I love Amazon Prime. Amazon has a feature that really we don't talk about very much, but they have that x-ray feature that right. is actually really quite useful. I really like it a lot. Yeah? Yeah. I, I mean... Because it's just, you get a quick like, oh, so I, I'm like, who's... I know that guy. And then you look and you're like, oh. For, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, this x-ray feature, and I'm sure I'm not even telling you all that it does, but if you're watching something on Amazon Prime and then you pause it, It'll bring up all the actors in the scene, give you options to find out more about them. Because, like, have you, how many times have you watched a movie and you're like, oh, my God, who's that? Oh, that guy. I know that guy. All you got to do is hit pause. It's almost like getting an instant IMDB just for a minute. It's, it's like, you know, we were talking the other day about special features. It's like an ongoing special feature. Yeah. And it does it from scene to scene. Yes. Like, sometimes they talk about what song, you know, was yes. in this scene. And you can get that information, too. It's a really cool little feature that they probably copyright, but it'd be nice to see other streaming services start to include something like that. It's very cool. Along the way. All right, next up. Thanks for sending us that information, Garden Variety. That's a really good study you did for yourself there. All right. Uh, Garden Variety also writes, Related to my last three, I must admit that much of the CW has been hate-watching for the last few years. I wish I knew how to quit you. I, You know, you and I have this discussion all the time. I I don't get the concept of hate watching. Like once I, because to me, once I recognize a show does not work for me, you and I are both aware that there's so much good TV out there yeah. that 
a lot of it I don't watch because I just don't have time. And so once I realize that a show is not going to work for me, I tap out. Not because I hate the show, but it's, hey, look, for whatever reason, the show isn't working for me. So instead of, number one, subjecting myself to spending time, because we have only a certain fixed amount of time on this earth. Right. So instead of spending what hours I have, <laughs> watching something or doing something I'm not enjoying, why don't I use that time and invest in something I might enjoy? So like a good example of that, I mean, it happens often, but a, an example of that would be like the, the recent Star Wars, um, the Bad Batch show, right? So Lucasfilm sent me an early box set of like with a whole bunch of goodies, including the, the episodes. And I watched the first episode. I'm like, you know what? This isn't bad. And then I watched episode two and episode three and it became clear to me. Okay, no, this, this doesn't matter. I mean, I love the swag they sent me, but I mean, but this isn't working for me. So I could have spent a number more hours watching it and then complaining about it. Or what I did instead was I tapped out and I started watching something else that I ended up enjoying. And so I don't understand the concept of hate watching. Now, you, on the other hand, like, and, and by the way, Bad Batch is a Star Wars thing. Right. And I am a Star Wars fanatic. But even at Star Wars, if it's something that isn't working for me, instead of watching it in spite, I just go, you know what? Tap out, I'll find something I like. You take a different approach. Because you don't like modern Star Trek, but you will watch every episode of Martin Star Trek. Yeah, I mean... I, and then complain about it. But well, you will watch everything about it. So what's the fundamental thing there about that? I consider myself, this is going to seem strange, a student of the Star Trek franchise. Every incarnation, comic books. I have hundreds of Star Trek novels. I've got Star Trek spaceship model kits. Uh, hundreds of Star Trek... Uh, I've, I, Star Trek has been a thing in my life, John, since I was a little kid. Hmm. It has grown and changed. Literally, I started watching Star Trek when I was five. Soon after the animated series came on the air, the two season animated series, then they announced Star Trek, the motion picture. Then there was a series of Star Trek movies in 87, Star Trek, the next generation, 93, Star Trek, Deep Space Nine, 95, Voyager, 2001, Enterprise, 2009, the J.J. Abrams Star Trek movie. So literally my entire life, Star Trek has been an ongoing living franchise that has informed my own life. And I can't not watch it because sometimes Star Trek has been really good. Sometimes it hasn't, but it's something I've studied. Like if I were to get a PhD in something, it would be in Star, Star Trek, as silly as that might seem. That's only for my own edification though. I wouldn't presume to push that on anyone else. But Star Trek has, it, it, right now I feel it's ebbing, not flowing. Mm. <laughs> it's, that's, a, that's a very diplomatic way of saying that. Well said. <laughs> there you go. All right, next up, Blake writes, do you think we'll see a quick bit of backstory of Bruce's training to become the Batman? Or will they skip that, as was with the latest Spider-Man? Given that he has no superpowers, I really would like that context, I think, but it could work either way if done well. Uh, Blake, what you're saying makes sense to me, but we've seen it. Like, we, we've, we've seen it. We've been there. I don't think we need it anymore. We all know... Bruce Wayne's origin stories. And that's part of the things that I really like about us picking up in year two of him being Batman. We don't, like, look, this movie's already almost three hours long. Do we need it to be long, or do we need to take up some of that three hours with stuff that we already know? Like, when we see Batman beating the living shit out of some people in the streets, these gangs, and he's beating the living crap, do we, that's that's all we need to know. Do we need to, well, wait a minute. How did he do that? We know. Uh, I mean, he, he trained at some point. And, and so I'm kind of of the belief that, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Let's pick up this thing in year two and let's just tell the story from there. What do you think? 100%. I agree 100% with you. When you're watching Lethal Weapon, you know, and you meet Mel Gibson's, you meet Riggs and Murtaugh, and Murtaugh's like, you know, your 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 arms, your hands are registered as Lethal Weapons. You don't have to go, well, when I was growing up, I learned these kinds of martial arts fighting techniques. I was a special forces officer in the war. I worked in Vietnam. All you need to know is, oh, his 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 hands are registered as lethal weapons. Clearly, he had training. We understand that. Now we can watch him be a cop. He's a cop. 
You know, and I never thought when I'm watching Lethal Weapon, I never said to myself, James Bond. In Dr. No, James Bond is fully formed. He shows up at the craps table or baccarat table. I'm Bond, James Bond. You don't need to go, wow, I need to see his time in the British Navy to understand <laughs> who he was. No, he's already there. And, and it's inferred by his ability. And I think when we meet Bruce Wayne, we're going to meet him. He's a young version of Batman, sure. But we already know, and we're going to be given a context that he clearly already knows what he's doing. We're going to see that in his Batcave that he's tinkering with his car, you know, the old train station. We will be given enough that we can infer his past through what we see him do in the present. I agree. So I think, but look, anything is possible. They could show that, but I, I'm thinking that they won't. I think they want to just dive right into his story. Yeah. All right. Next up, we have Angel uh, on Thorn. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Angel, who writes, Hey, crew. Tim Burton and Matt Reeves are two very stylistically different directors. Reeves has directed two film franchises that Burton has previously made in Planet of the Apes and Batman. Both also have made vampire, starring, vampire films starring Chloe Grace Moretz. That's right, because Reeves let me did in. Let, let Me In, which is a remake, and he, uh, what's... Uh, Dark Shadows. Dark Shadows. I almost said What We Do in the Shadows with, uh, with Burton. Anyway, uh, Angel goes on to write, uh, with Let Me In and Dark Shadows. My question is, what Tim Burton film would you love to see a Matt Reeves-style remake of? I personally would love to see, uh, the idea of Matt Reeves' Mars Attacks. Kidding. Uh, mostly. First time writing and love the show. Cheers. First of all, that is a pretty... I never even thought about that. About the Very kind of interesting. The, the similar paths between Tim Burton and Matt Reeves. Um, I don't... I mean, okay, you know what I've never seen him do? Never seen Matt Reeves do musical. So, um, the demon barber of, of uh, what's the Sweeney name? Sweeney Todd. Sweeney Todd. That could be interesting. That could be very interesting. Seeing a Matt Reeves do, I can't really think of any of the others that I think would be a good fit, but just because some I've never seen him done, do you think he, Matt Reeves could slip into a, a remake of one of Tim Burton's movies? Yeah. Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Directed by Matt Reeves. Come on. <laughs> I know that's a little glib. I know it's glib. I know. <laughs> but it could be fun. It could be fun, dude. A Matt Reeves Pee Wee Herman movie. <laughs> All right. Next up, we got uh, Tijuana Taste It writes. Uh, hey, gang. My favorite comic book character is Spawn. The 1997 movie sucked. So in a perfect imaginary world, how cool would it be if Ben Affleck directed the next Spawn movie by tweaking and using the Batman script he made? It may fit or may not. I mean, because remember, Batman is a regular human being. S tweak that yeah. to a to our general of the armies of hell, supernatural being. Maybe a little bit different. Man, I, I just still think Spawn's fate kind of got sealed when uh, Todd McFarland, good Canadian kid, by the way, announced that he was going to make another Spawn movie and he was going to direct it and he was going to do the script and he was going to do all that. And then three, two years later, we see him writing the, like these articles about him complaining. Why are people giving me money to make this movie? Gee, I wonder why. I, I, I just, I don't know if we're ever going to get this live action thing or not. So, but, but Jamie Foxx signed on, and uh, freaking Hawkeye, Jeremy Renner signed on, and everybody got all excited. But actors will say, sure, yeah, you can attach me to that. A movie it's that hasn't been greenlit means no contracts have been signed yet. It's so, also a tough movie, dude. It's a it's tough It's a tough movie. That's that, a, that already has a track record of failure, unfortunately. Yeah, and, and it didn't just kind of fail. Yeah. <laughs> it failed spectacular. I mean, John Leguizamo is the clown. I actually kind of liked, but that movie was all over the place. It was a really hard watch. Although, you had President uh, uh, Bartlett in there. <laughs> yeah. President, that, that was kind of fun. I still kind of shake my head when I go back and look at that. But listen, yeah, forget the Batman script. Forget that. You announce tomorrow that Ben Affleck is directing a Spawn movie. You're going to get my attention. You're going to get a lot of people's attention. Yep. But not as long as Todd McFarlane tries to be involved creatively. And that's, if Jamie Foxx stars, that's a package. Yep. Yep. You get them signed on the dotted line, all that kind of stuff. But I don't think Todd McFarlane will give that up. I think he wants to be the one to make it. I think that's a mistake. But... I think that's what's held it up so far, to be honest with you. But what do I know? All right, next up. Mason M. Uh, just tips in $20 to be supportive. Thank you, Mason M. Appreciate that, man, very much. Uh, Alec uh, Meeballs writes, 
Oscars would bring out the cast slash crew of The Godfather to honor the 50th anniversary. That's the stuff I want to see instead of five boring That's musical That's a great idea. But it's, see, he's right. You see, it's that kind of stuff that I'm told. It's the 50th anniversary of what many cinephiles consider to be the greatest film ever made. And both Godfather 1 and 2 won Best Picture. Yeah, and Godfather 3 got nominated for Best Picture. Yep. Only, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but only two trilogies in history have had all three tri had all, all three installments of the trilogies nominated for Best Picture. That's The Godfather and The Lord of the Rings. <clears throat> I don't think it'll ever happen again, to be honest with you. No. But, I mean, see, that's what we were talking about earlier, about, you know what, yes, I want the Oscars to be quicker, but I do love the pomp and circumstance of the stuff that really is celebrating the industry. Not a lot of the fluff they normally do, but some like, yeah, take five minutes to... Bring out the cast, the surviving cast of The Godfather, uh, to say a word or two, show a quick two minute um, montage of The Godfather, and you bring out Francis, Francis Ford Coppola to kind of just give, give a thank you to, to everybody for making The Godfather what it has been all the year. Five minutes, done. Five out of the 180 minutes on Godfather, one of the most important films ever made in the history of the business. Yeah, that kind of stuff. I dig it. I dig it. I'm in. Especially more than the music numbers. All right. Next over, uh, Trevor Summers writes, Hey, y'all. Some people have their ideas for Batman villains for possible Matt Reeves Batman sequels. But would you like to see the Riddler in any sequels? Uh, what if it's a Batman slash Riddler trilogy only? Or is that too much? We'll find out uh, how this movie ends soon. Well, I mean, here's the problem, Trevor. You're asking me a question about a character I've not seen yet. Right. I mean, uh, so I have I have no idea. Listen, we could find the Batman to be the best movie of the year, but we also might f think that the Riddler's played out now, or we might think it's the best film of the year and think, yeah, man, they got to keep this going. I mean, look at Rocky One and Rocky Two. The antagonist in both was Apollo. You can keep that going. I mean, Infinity War, Endgame, it's Thanos. Um, Lord of the Rings, it's Sauron. Now, they had minor bosses, lower-level bosses along the way, but ultimately, it's all Sauron. So, yeah, you could, you could have a Batman versus Riddler trilogy. You can, but whether that's something they should do with this or not, I, I can't say because we haven't seen one minute of this film yet. Right. I don't know. What do you think? I, I agree. It, I, we're being asked a question that we don't have enough information to answer. I, I don't know what the relationship between Batman and the Riddler is going to be. I don't know what the relationship with Batman and anyone's going to be. So I can't make a decision about what I'd want to see in sequels. I Indeed. do want to see it be good. That's all I can tell you. Please be good. Yeah, so in theory, can it be done? Well, yeah, I just ran off a whole bunch of movies that their villain or the, the antagonist span multiple films. I mean, I but... think what our viewer is also asking is, could there be a situation where you could tell a story over three movies about the antagonistic relationship between Batman and one villain? Right. I think that could happen if the scripts were great. And right. if there was if there was a long term story, and you have a villain like Sauron in the the idea was to take Sauron down in in Lord of the Rings, there could be a villain who's got a long game that's playing something, and it, you escalate every time. That could be done. It would be it would take a lot of great skill, but I I don't object to that. But I can't say that about Paul Dano as the Riddler. Yeah, it's just because we haven't seen it yet, so we have to find out. All right, next up. We've got Willow, who tips in like $50. Thank you, Willow, for supporting us on that level. And Willow writes, I am unable to watch a show live these days, but I'm delighted to see Chris, Rob, and Aaron back. And Ray is just hilarious. Ray is hilarious. Uh, anyway, happy birthday. Thank you so much. You have officially now been on Earth for half a century. It's true. It's my, my birthday this weekend. I am turning 50. 50 years old this weekend. Still younger than J-Lo. You look 40. Oh, uh, thank you. Still younger than J-Lo and still younger than Jared Leto. So I'm, I'm just going to keep hanging on to that. But thank you so much for the well. It's, it, technically, it's not my birthday today. But it's my birthday tomorrow. But thank you so much for that, Will. And thank you so much for being a long-term supporter of our channel very, very much. All right. Next up. Uh, that was Willow. Next, we have Miles. And Miles writes, Hey, John or Rob, uh, been, been loved Peacemaker. Uh, it is my favorite superhero show ever that I went and bought the new Peacemaker Hot Toys, and it will be my first one I ever owned. Also, hoping to get Battinson Batman Hot Toy when it becomes available. And I found out about the Peacemaker Hot Toy 
by getting a text from you <laughs> saying, bro, have you seen this? <laughs> it's like, oh my God. And it comes with Eagly. With multiple wing configurations. <laughs> and multiple hands. And a movable tongue. Yeah. I mean, and, and full on weapons. Looks pretty damn good. And so, multiple helmets. So if you get a chance um to uh, get that batson one the, they haven't made that one available yet right no but they have announced that they have the um license <laughs> and also jazz inc dioramas that makes batmobiles it's coming out with a six scale batmobile from the original series at the 66 series and the batman forever batmobile has announced they've shown their prototypes that they're making the new batmobile in six scale nice all right next up we've got sure shot rights one of three Hey, John and crew, I missed your show on Tuesday and caught your clip on the Batman and the BBFC. Like you, I'm looking forward to seeing it, and I'm booked in at my favorite Dolby Cinema. Nice. Uh, here in the UK, when Spider-Man came out as a 12, remember, in the, in, the, in the UK, the rating system is not the same as here. They have 12, 12A, 15, and 18. So 12 is kind of like your PG, 12A is kind of like your PG-13, 15 is like R, 18 is like NC-17. Anyway, when Spider-Man came out as a 12, parents revolted against the cinemas, and eventually the 12A replaced the 12 rating. If the 15 is replaced with a 15A rating, that would be interesting and would allow parents to decide for themselves. Um, the BBFC have controversially banned a lot of films over the years, including Evil Dead 1 and 2, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and more recently Reservoir Dogs, although uh, all of them were later released in the UK with a standard 18 rating. So there's been some discussion. We talked about this on the show the other day. There's been some discussion going on within the theater industry in the UK about should they introduce a 15A? Because right now, we talked about this on the John Campus show earlier, in the UK, if your movie gets a 15, that means if you're under 15, you can't get into a movie. It doesn't matter if you have an adult with you or not. In R rating in the States, you can be 10 years old and still get into an R-rated movie if your parent brings you or if an adult brings you. In the UK, a 15, you can't get in if you're under 15, period. End of sentence. No joy. Do not pass go. Do not collect $100. You're done. So there's been some discussion about for the Batman, create a 15A. That is, okay, if you're under 15, you can still get in with an adult. And that's been the discussion there because I believe, what is it, the Republic of Ireland? The Republic of Ireland has a very similar rating system, except I believe they have a 15A. And that's what they've given Batman. Yeah. Whereas the UK does not have a 15A. They just have 15A. They just have 15, I mean, that's basically R-rated. And they just slap that on the Batman, which means kids can't go see it. They can buy the Legos, but they can't go see it. So I look, I'm not advocating for there being 55 different rating levels. But I, again, I just like the idea that the parent gets to decide what their kid can and cannot go see. And I think a 15A, you know, as a, a, a something below the harder 15, I think that makes sense for them. I don't know. What do you think? I mean, I, I think it makes sense. I'm, I I think that parents should always be allowed to parent their children. I don't like the idea that the state is telling parents what they what their kids can and can't see. And I think if a parent wants to take their child to see a film, they should be able to do that. I mean, basically, you've got the government who's stepped in here and said, nope, your child is not allowed to see this film. I would say when I was 14, I was pretty precocious. I was seeing all different kinds of movies. If someone told me I couldn't see a new Batman movie and I was 14, I, 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 I don't know what I would have done. I would have been apoplectic, John. I would have been like, what do you, the government tells me I can't see a Batman movie? Think about that. That's kind of weird. And guess what? In six or seven weeks, your parent can show you the Batman movie as much as you want. Right. Right. So if in six or seven weeks, the parent can show their kid this movie if they want, why not also give the parent the choice if they want to bring their kid to go see it in the theater? But I'm look, I'm sure not all kids are the same level of maturity. Yeah, and I'm sure I'm oversimplifying it. Like I'm sure it's probably a little bit more complex than that. But again, I mean, unless you have a rule that says we got a report that you showed your child Batman in the privacy of your own home, you're, um, they're obviously not doing that. You can show your kid whatever you want to show them at home. 
then why not let the parent have the choice if they want to take them to see the movies? I don't know. Again, I might be oversimplifying it, but that's kind of how I see it. All right, thanks for that sure shot. All right, Wicked Man writes, Hey, in my opinion, I think foreign films have been better than American films lately. For example, Parasite, Portrait of a Lady on Fire, Roma. I didn't like Roma, to be honest with you. Mm. I'm one of the few people I know that didn't like Roma. Anyway, another round. And uh, what I think was the best movie of the year, worst person in the world. What do you think? I disagree. Look, it, it's, it's easy to oversimplify stuff. There have been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of movies released in the last year and a half, two years. So... It's easy to oversimplify when you cherry pick a couple of big ones here and a couple of big ones there. And look, for for instance, for me, West Side Story, it's not even close for me, to be honest. Like, to me, and I know it, it's, it's losing momentum in the Oscar race, so it's probably not going to win. But for me, nothing else is close. Like, West Side Story is the best film of the year. And I like it, and I love Parasite, but I think it was better than Parasite. I think it was better than Lady on Fire. I love Lady on Fire, too, by the way. I certainly think it was better than Roma. It's like just the best movie I've seen. Dune is spectacular to me. Dune is absolutely, absolutely fantastic. Uh, one of the other foreign films you didn't mention, though, that I would put in that conversation is Belfast. Yeah. Belfast is incredible. But I, it's one thing like, oh, you know what? My couple of my favorites have been foreign films. Foreign films have been better than American films. I think that's oversimplifying a bit. I don't know, Rob, how would you address that? Uh, look, all the films that he brought up, other, with the exception of the worst person in the world I've seen and I've loved, I think that the, what you're talking about is the subject matter of American films has been more limited than it used to be in the past. I mean, studios used to make a wide variety. They would make comedies. They would make dramas. They'd make political thrillers. They'd make sci-fi epics. They'd make a lot of different kinds of movies. And that has been sort of limited because studios are now spending more money on films and they're spending more um, uh, of their resources to make IP films because they're making films that are $100 million for the world market. You know, they can't make, by definition, they can't make character studies like I Love the Verdict. That was a 20th Century Fox movie. If it exists as a studio, they wouldn't make that movie today. You know, they just wouldn't. Whereas in, in foreign territories... I loved another round. Mads Mikkelsen and his friends decide they want to be alcoholics. You know, they're not going to make that at a studio. The only way you can see a movie like that is if they make it in Denmark, which is what they did. Right. So, but I, I, I don't know if you could say better. I would say just different. You know, we're getting a, a different kind of storytelling, a very diverse storytelling across different subject matter. But on the other hand, they're not going to make a Spider-Man No Way Home in another foreign country. They're going to make that here in America. They're not going to make Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. They're not going to make the Batman. So American movies are filling a niche or filling a, uh, a, a an area that foreign films won't. And I think people get tired sometimes of just seeing IP films or big films like that. And Portrait of a, Woman, a Lady on Fire, that was a great movie. But you're not going to see Disney make that movie or Warner Brothers. All right. Next up. We've got Sean, who just tips in $30 to say, keep up the great work. Thank you so much. It's always so cool when somebody just wants to write in and tip in and contribute and just to say something encouraging. Thank you for that, man. We appreciate that, Sean. All right. Jed Elias writes, hot take. The Departed has some of the worst editing and storytelling of Scorsese's career. Character development was confusing and pacing dragged on a lot. Fun enough time, but not best picture worthy. Wolf of Wall Street and Shutter Island deserved more. I, I mean, hey, listen, it's not a hot take, Jed. That's your perception of the film. That was your experience with it. And your experience is every bit as valid as mine. But being as it's my show, I will tell you that my experience was fundamentally different. I thought the character development was amazing. I followed every single step and every single beat with each one of these characters. I thought the editing and the pacing was immaculately done. And when that movie ended, my heart was still racing fast. By the way, you so, have the same editor working on all three movies. Really? Yeah, it's Thelma Schoonmacher. Oh, I didn't know she did that for him, too. I believe that she did. I could be wrong, but I believe it. it she did all three. So, yeah, like, listen, I, I love those films as well. Shutter Island is an underrated Scorsese film, by the way. Oh. Also done with Leonardo DiCaprio. All three of them were done with Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, Wolf of Wall Street is great. Jonah Hill was <coughs> wonderful in that. But, yeah, to me, it's still the depart. That, that, to me, is still his best film. And those are wildly different movies. Yeah. All made by the same director. And I can understand somebody preferring one over the other. And by the way, I love Wolf of Wall Street. Love it, John. So good. Love it. It's so wildly entertaining. 
And I would dare say that I think that Wolf of Wall Street is more fun than The Departed. For sure. But The Departed still a great movie, and so is Shutter Island. Different experiences. What I love about all three of those movies is because they're very different, made by the same filmmaker, starring the same actor, look at the range you get. Look at the range in terms of storytelling and in terms of, 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 of feelings and what you as a viewer get from all three of those movies. Amazing. Absolutely. All right, next up. We got an anonymous viewer who writes, what's Alfonso Cuaron up to these days? I think he's just like producing now. Yeah, I don't know what he's doing. Um, uh, hasn't made anything since Roma in 2018 and would love to see more from him after Gravity. Hope I can see in the theater one day. Gravity is a fun movie to watch on a big screen. Dude. That's a really cool movie to see you know, on a big screen. It's funny. I I uh I don't know why. It was, it was on maybe it was on HBO Max. I was like, ah, I haven't seen that. I just clicked on it. I figured I'd watch a couple minutes. I watched the whole thing. Oh, it's hard <laughs> to turn that way. It's, it's a really good movie. Wow. Did it get nominated for Best Picture? I it might have. I thought it might have. What an okay. achievement that movie is. Yeah. All right. Oh, sorry. Let's keep going on here. Um, let's see in theater. Last I checked, he's producing a movie for Apple Plus. Uh, maybe partnership is eminent. I, again, I'm not sure because you had what they called in the press the three amigos, right? Who I believe between the three of them, Alfonso Cuaron, um, Guillermo del Toro, and, and Iteratu. And Iteratu. I believe they won between the three of them, won best director like four years in a row or, or something like that. I can't remember. I, I might be off about that, but all three of them have won the Academy Awards, uh, one of them multiple times. But yeah, I don't know. Here's the thing. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Alfonso was taking time off because you don't get it. Directing a movie, any movie, requires everything you've got. Heart, soul, soul mind, strength. Passion, everything you got. And look got. at what that guy did in twenty years. And he and he's also done very artistic films, films that have gone above and beyond. And, and a Harry I Potter would, movie. Yeah, and I wouldn't doubt at all if he's like, I'm I'm taking five years off. I'm taking five years off. I don't know what what would you like? Would you like to see him come back? Do you like? Oh, film? dude, he's an amazing world class filmmaker. I love his work. But if you think, I mean, he did Children of Men. Caron did Children of Men. He did a Harry Potter movie. He did Gravity. He did Roma. You know, I mean, what a what a talent that guy is. My God. Now, I'm just looking it up here, and he does have a, a TV series that he's going to do some directing on called Ascension. And Ascension, I'm looking it up right now, so you have to forgive me. Uh, Ascension, they're not saying anything about it. Nobody attached, nothing like that. So apparently he's working on some TV series. Cause that's probably the Apple TV Plus thing. Yeah. But I guess he's not just listed as a producer. Then maybe he'll do a, a direct a couple of the episodes. But you're right. He has not done anything since Roma from a directing point of view. Let me just bring this up again to double check. But yeah, the last film he directed was 2018's Roma. Won an Academy. Or, wait, did he win the Academy Award that year for Best Director? I, th I think, think he did. He did. But at any rate. Or it so, won Best Foreign Film or something. So we'll have to keep our eyes on that for sure. All right. Next up, we've got Movies That Get Me writes. Hey, John or Rob, or both of us, uh, the movie scene that gets me every time is the scene at the end of Logan. From the death uh, to the turning of the X, gets me every time, and even now just typing about it, I'm crying. Perfect movie. Logan, also, Hurt will always be part of Logan for me. It is... I... I, I hesitate ever using the term other than talking about Daniel Day-Lewis about the greatest thing ever. I believe there's an argument that the Logan trailer with Johnny Cash's version of Hurt might be the greatest movie trailer ever. <laughs> I mean, because you didn't know, need to know anything about Logan or X-Men or whatever. That trailer itself was powerful. Yeah. It was exciting. It carried emotional weight. It did... And it was the perfect pairing of imagery and sound. and what It is a perfect trailer. I'm not saying definitively it's the greatest trailer of all time, but I'm telling you what, if we have a discussion about the greatest trailers of all time, that, that one's in the discussion for sure. Yeah, although I don't know. It's a great trailer, but I don't know, John, I'll never know because I've already seen the X-Men movies and the Wolverine movies. There was an extra added bump because... It was unexpected. Mm -hmm. It was unexpected that they could elicit that kind of like, who would have thought Johnny Cash would have been part of an X-Men trailer? Yeah, you absolutely. Know? But man, what a great, what, what I loved about it, it was even the marketing. 
they knew that like this is not just an X Men movie. Oh yeah, this is something more. And they presented it such, and that trailer went a long way toward priming the audience to know what they were going to get. Cause and mangled man, like bro, oh. dude, come on. Between that, Ford v Ferraris, doing Indiana Jones now. I mean, that and he's by the way, he's the reason I still have any excitement for this Indiana Jones film, if it ever actually comes out. Yeah, because they've been making that since 1947. I know it's, uh, but just because he's directing it, I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt. All right. Next up, we got, oh, Captain, my captain, who writes, hey, John, I want to, uh, where we go? Oh, by the way, I need tips in like $25. Thank you, oh, Captain, my captain. Appreciate that, man. Uh, he writes, hey, John, I want to commend you on your show and team. It just gets better and better and brings me comfort to watch you. Oh, thanks for that, man. Uh, Rob, Chris, Aaron, and Ray, um, crush it each day. Been a longtime fan, and you are all my source for movie news. Love you all. Oh, man, that is so nice. And Rob, you nice. and I will talk about how amazing it is when people just write in kind of stuff like that because you get this stuff too all the time. Yeah, I mean, you know, because we it's funny, John. People don't understand. Like, I'm sitting here in your studio that you built. I'm looking at you. I'm looking at the equipment you have. But we don't have any sense of who's watching, where they're watching, <laughs> how they're watching. You know, we heard earlier today from a, a doctor who's talking about watching the show with their patient. You would never get a sense of that where we are. We have a sense of each other, and it's really fun to do the show, but it's so crazy to think there are people from all walks of life all around the world watching this show, and, and when they write in and tell us this, it's really nice to hear because we don't get a sense of that at all. Like, we don't have a... There's no indicator that says there are 78 people watching you from Spain. Right. <laughs> you know, we don't know. It's We don't know. And you know what? It's what I have... Especially the last few months... When you say we don't know who's watching, it's crazy because it's not just fans right. watching. Right. Now, for, forgive the slight flex here, <laughs> but only because I think it's relevant to the conversation. Um, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break a, a good piece of advice you gave me, but it, it's relevant to the conversation. Like, here's an example. Like, never knowing about Who's watching? Uh, I think it was two weeks ago, like after Boba Fett episode five, which is the one that had the Mandalorian in it, the one that was directed by Bryce Dallas Howard. We did an episode uh, where we addressed a question from an audience member saying, you know, do you think Bryce Dallas Howard should now direct a Star Wars movie? And, and we said emphatically, yes. Yeah. She has shown over now three episodes that she's directed in this Mandalorian Boba Fett universe. She's shown over like three spectacular episodes that she gets. I'm not saying she's the greatest director in the world, but she definitely has a lot of talent and she shows that she understands Star Wars better than most. I'm sure that has something to do with the fact that she grew up around George Lucas. Oof, right. Because her dad was a buddy of George Lucas. Her dad Lucas. directed Willow. Yeah. Big buddy of George Lucas. So I'm sure that has something to do with it. You want to talk about <laughs> you never know who's watching? I came into the studio. True story. I came into the studio the next day. Or I, no, I didn't even come in. I I, 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 I sent it to you guys. You and said I showed it, yeah. you. Bryce Dallas Howard emailed me after we did that episode. Just, and, and I won't tell you what she said, but it's, and I, like, I showed it to you guys. And I'm like, but it goes to your point. Like, you never know who's watching the show. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to say who. But like last week, we had the exact same situation. We had a topic on the show that we were talking about. And the principal involved with that topic emailed us. And we we're like, and so it has been crazy about like now we sit down to do the show and like literally we don't know who's watching. Nope. And it's, it's kind of fun. It's kind of neat but it's, it's always different. I'll tell you, I had an experience last year where a very heavy hitter in the industry wrote in to correct me. <laughs> and it wasn't, I didn't, it, it, I had forgotten something that this person was involved with that was in between two other projects. And they wrote in to make sure that I knew that I was talking about a person that wasn't them. And they, but they were involved with this person. They said, you know, this person's also doing this for me. 
And I totally forgot about that. And I was, first of all, I was shocked that this person wrote me. And at first I'm like, is this, I wrote back an email. I'm like, is this really you? <laughs> and they wrote me back and they said, yes. And they, they, they proved it. But I, I didn't, you know, I, I, I had to know because we get punked and people write to us all the time. But then we developed this relationship and I've been able to ask this person industry to comment on industry trends. And I've got insight that I never would have got. And it was because that person chose to write to me because I made a mistake. And I thought it was really nice that they, because I don't want, we don't want to be wrong. Like we're trying to bring factual or as factual. Yeah, we're mostly doing op-ed stuff, but you also want to bring our viewers the most up-to-date factual information as possible. And if I had, I didn't say anything wrong. I just forgotten something. And I really appreciated it. And I couldn't believe, I'm like, you watch this show? It was crazy. <laughs> like, really? Speaking I... of being wrong and getting contacted, the very the reason I don't do scoops, like maybe once a year, because you guys wouldn't believe half the stuff that I find out and sit on and then we don't reveal it and then it comes out later. But one of the reasons I'm like that is because the very first time, this is back when I was doing the movie blog, the very first time I thought I had a big scoop I got it from what I considered to be a very reliable source. And this was all the way back in the movie blog days when Edgar Wright was still the attached director for Ant-Man. And I had gotten the scoop that Adrian Brody, Academy Award winning actor Adrian Brody was going to be Ant-Man. And it was as solid, as I thought, as solid information as could be. So I get on my website the movie blog and i'm right i can tell everybody right now that adrian brody is going to be ant-man and i felt pretty good about that i'm breaking the scoop rob that's when i got my first message from edgar wright <laughs> wow <laughs> telling me that's a delightful idea but i don't know where you got that from because he's not <laughs> and it's like so i had to get on my site again the next day to say yeah, I remember that. And, and it was it sucked because at that point, the movie blog was starting to get a little bit of traction. So other websites saw that I wrote that Adrian Brody was going to be Ant-Man. And so they picked it up. And uh, and so, yeah, I had to come out the next day and say, yeah, I found out from a very reliable source that Adrian, I was wrong. Adrian yeah, Brody but at least you that. corrected it. Well, yeah, you know, I always got to correct it. You didn't double down. You know, no, no, I, I mean, some it. people have don't correct that stuff. Yeah. Well, I still don't care. I, I, I very much care when I was wrong about that. So, uh, yeah. Anyway. OK. Sorry. Uh, thank you for that. Um, oh, there was part two of this. Love you all. Then another one from Oh, Captain, My Captain. I tried out Regal's 4DX theater and oh, my God, I had so much fun with that experience. I saw the recently released Scream movie and a man and man was that bonkers to watch in that way? Have you ever tried 4DX? I saw they had some showing for Raiders in 4DX. No, I honestly, even when 4DX comes up, I I usually accidentally say it's a Cinemark thing, right? But no, it's a, it's a Regal thing. I have never been at 4DX. Me neither. I mean, I, I maybe three times in my life I've been in a Regal cinema. No disrespect to Regal. I just, whenever I've, I, they, we didn't have them in Canada, and ever since I lived in the, in the States, the first place I lived was right in Hollywood on Sunset. And I lived a 10-minute walk up the street from the Arclight. So for the first couple of years, my theater was the Arclight. And then when we moved to Burbank, or sorry, when I moved to out to Riverside the first time years ago, uh, we had the AMC Tyler Galleria in Riverside. So I went to that. Then, when, then Ann and I moved into Burbank, we had the AMC Burbank 16. I obviously then we had our studio there for a while. Then when we moved back out to Riverside, we got the AMC. So I've just always been around either the Arclight or AMCs. That's it. So I've been to Regal Theaters three times. Never been to a 4DX, neither of you. But some sometime, I got to try it out. Yeah, I would try it out. Always hear decent things about it. All right, next up. Old Danny Boy writes, last <laughs> minute predictions boy. about the Batman before seeing it on Tuesday. Either Batman and the Riddler are related somehow or Bruce was adopted and Riddler was in the same foster home. Well, Rob, you and I have speculated for a couple of months now that the way Riddler says the stuff he's saying and then the way Bruce has some pretty angry conversations with Alfred, I think it's pretty clear that Riddler is actually a Wayne. Could very well be. I, I, I think 
I think they're they're brothers. I, I mean, I have nothing to base that on. That's just a wild speculation we're going in. But you're not alone in thinking that there's a connection. I don't know what do you, what do you think about that theory right now? I I think it's definitely possible. I mean, you know, why not? I don't know. I hope they do it in such a way that I'll buy into that. Yeah, I don't usually like it when let's make them siblings. You know. It's, but it would be a twist. It's definitely a twist. We'll see. We're only four days away from finding out for sure, so we don't have to wait much longer. All right. Final question of the day comes into us from Stephen Stranger Things, <laughs> who writes, Hey, JC and crew, looking forward to Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness and the possibility of any X-Men involvement in the MCU. Any thoughts on the movie Logan 2017, which we were just talking about? Any thoughts on the movie Logan being set in the future after the events of Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness? Love the show. Thank you. Zero chance. Um, James Mangold is already on record as saying that that Logan movie wasn't even part of the reality of the other X-Men films. Like, I remember we talked about it. It might have been, was it, that was, we still have been in AMC. Maybe we were at Collider at that point. But we discussed that when Mangold made those statements that, yeah, this is not even really the same continuity as the rest of the X-Men films. So I would say I, I'm, I'm taking James Mangold at what he said, and I don't see there being any reason why Kevin Feige would feel the need to try to tie that in. I mean, tie in, if they want to tie in Wolverine, even Hugh Jackman's Wolverine, you do it with the X-Men continuity, continuity, schmontinuity. But I don't think there's any chance that they tie in in any way uh, the Logan film, which is an utter complete masterpiece. I have a top three favorite comic book films of all time that I think are the best comic book films ever made. And the number one spot for me is the original Avengers movie. And then in two and three, in whatever order you want, is The Dark Knight and Logan. And I believe those that's the holy trinity of the best comic book movies I believe ever made. So that's what I think of Logan. Anyway, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, obviously with the multiverse now, I, it, Patrick Stewart is indeed Charles Xavier, and I would assume he is. I mean, he's not Picard. But if if so, we know that a Patrick Stewart version of Professor X is actually in this movie. But like Mangold said, the version of Professor X and Logan that we saw in the movie Logan is not part of the X-Men continuity as we saw it, but it's adjacent. It's in another it's a multiverse film. It's in a different ver the X-Men did exist. They were destroyed, you know, and they there's mutants in that world. It's just a different world. It's a different iteration of the X-Men. So I don't think that we are going to have any kind of connection to that universe in Doctor Strange. Right. Other than the fact that, you know, I would see Patrick Stewart's Xavier, there would be almost an infinite number of that character in multiverses that we're never going to see. Right. And there's there's obviously a blanket statement you have to make with anything involving the MCU right now, which is anything's possible. I mean, it, it, we live in a world now where Jamie Foxx came back to play Electro and never would have thought that would happen. So, I mean, I, again, for everything you, for every reason you just laid out, Rob, I think it's extremely unlikely. But again, this is Kevin Feige's world. And in this world, anything is, is possible. Yeah, I mean, but the thing is, uh, we know that Patrick Stewart died in, in Logan. You know, I right, mean, but he also died in well, uh x-men was it dark the, phoenix the no, last not dark, 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 the last, the last he died yeah. in x-men the last stand yeah so he's so we've seen so that i would say that it's probably not that continuity it's but remember, a continuity. he's asking if the logan film can be a future event like logan happens after dr strange the well i mean maybe the results right? of whatever happens in this movie is what leaves professor xavier mentally incapacitated the way he is in Logan. Yeah, I mean, if they want to do, I just, I don't see I don't think they're going to do that, but it would be kind of interesting if they, if they had a post credit scene, you see Logan and Professor Xavier driving around. Ah, Taliban. But I don't, yeah, I don't think that's going to be the case. All right, guys, that'll do it for this installment of Mailbag. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you to all of you guys who sent in those questions. Number one, because it gave us great fun things to talk about. But number two, you supported this channel as you did it. And all of us involved with the John Campy show, Thank you guys so very much for your support. I want to thank, of course, Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. Robert, where can people find you online? John, you can find me on Twitter at Burnett RM. Find me on Instagram at Robert Meyer Burnett, or it's actually RM Burnett, I think. Or find me on my own YouTube channel, The Burnett Network. And we're going to talk about physical media this Sunday. 
And uh, guys, you, of course, can find me on Instagram and on Twitter, simply at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks a lot for being here. My name's John Campia. Until next time, my friends, bye-bye.